Welcome back to the show, my fellow Extraordinary Americans. For today's guest, we have Leon Lineback. Leon is the founder and CEO of two companies, namely Keystone Construction LLC and Blue Jay Garage Doors LLC. He grew up in a farm and at the age of 16 started working as a laborer on a construction crew. By age 17, he was a supervisor on his team and at age 19 decided to take the risk of starting his own business. Since November 2005, he has been helping people build their dream post-frame buildings. Currently, his company, Keystone Construction, serves customers in Kentucky and Tennessee. The business has had good growth, especially in the last few years. High-quality buildings with excellent service is the standard, as well as providing excellent customer service and exceptional quality products. Keystone is founded on the five principles that outlines its values. These are putting God first in all decisions, a people-first mentality, humility, a growth mindset, and having fun. In 2020, Leon also founded Blue Jay Garage Doors, a garage door installation, service, and repair company. He is the example of an extraordinary American that came from humble beginnings to succeed in his field, and I'm honored to have him on the show. Uh, Leon, are you there? Yes, sir. Thanks Leon. for having me. Uh, yeah, thank you for coming on the show. I'm really excited to interview you because uh, like your story is pretty inspirational. So I know like you're a founder and a CEO of like two companies. Can you tell the me and the audience a little bit more about yourself, your background and how you got started? Sure. So uh, the primary company that I founded in 2005 is Keystone Construction. And uh, how I got started in that is I was working on a construction company, as uh, Cosmo mentioned there in the introduction. And I just got this dream of being able to help other people to build the buildings of their dreams. And so we, uh, in, two, in November 2005, we started off Keystone Construction. Okay. So like, how did you, uh, what was the process with which you start? Like, I know you were like, you grew up in a farm and then uh, like you started uh, being in the construction industry at a very young age, like age 16, age 17, like that is extremely young. Like, how did you go from there to starting your own business? And like, what was the entire process of like how you got to starting your own company? Yeah. So how that got started is, Growing up on a farm, we built most of our own buildings and homes. So I was around construction probably from the age seven to eight years old and uh, going with my dad doing different construction projects. So I was introduced at a very young age uh, over and over. So when I started out in age 16, it's like I already had eight years of you know, off and on experience in the, in the construction field. So it was very familiar. Uh, I enjoyed working outside. So that was one of the reasons I opted to go into that field. Uh, and, you know, being entrepreneur minded from a young age, like there was, um, there was a time between eight and 10 years old that I got into this idea of raising rabbits. And uh, my dad was very supportive of that. So, um, you know, I got male and female rabbits and raised a lot of rabbits and then sold them to customers. So that, that was really my first entrepreneurial journey. So getting started in construction at age 16, it was nothing, it was not new for me necessarily, but it was something I enjoyed. And um, being a natural leader, um, you know, I pretty quickly got promoted to a supervisor and being a uh, foreman on that career and then as time went on that's when I just got the desire for being able to run my own company and growing a company that can be a, a help to people as with people that we work with as well as building other people's dreams wow Leon so uh, you know there's like so many people are in the construction industry right and like they basically end up just like working the minimum uh like uh, the minimum paying job or they never really end up starting their own business so what was the difference in your mindset compared to like other people that that got you to take the risk of starting your own business in the field where most people would just be would just settle for like working for another company and just um just getting paid a certain amount 
I think that was really taught from my parents. Um, my dad was independent and he promoted independence and entrepreneurship. He, uh, he really believed that um, being capitalist and being independent, independent is one of the main thing that America thrives on or just population in general. And so that was really, a, that was something that we were taught from a young age. I see. So like, it was basically like a mindset that was like bred right from like a young age. Right. But the thing is like, it's extremely risky, especially in the construction industry. Right. Cause you know, you have a lot of people like, I mean, I don't know if it's true or not, but like the perspective that a lot of like people from, especially on the white collar worker world get is that the, the construction industry is a really tough business. And there's all these people that are trying to undermine the other person. And it's really tough, especially when it comes to New York, construction right uh, and stuff like that so uh, what was the thing that allowed you to like start a business and like risk everything and knowing that it's like a tough field relatively or or it is was it something else i'm a natural risk taker i think that's probably the biggest thing and it was something that uh my dad promoted is just you know go do it and figure it out um so when i look back thinking on that, I didn't really think that it was that huge of a risk, although it was. Um, so I think a lot of that comes again to the background of just being brought up, brought up in that environment of going ahead and taking risks, going, you know, just diving in, figuring, figuring it out. Uh, so it's, it's, it's definitely interesting um, to me to hear different perspectives when it comes to you know, how people view those risks. Um, because construction is a tough industry and it is something that you have to be willing to work hard and be able to go out and do take action and do what it takes. Yeah, I mean, it definitely is. And there's like a lot, there's like a lot of like saying about like how people can be really ruthless, but there's also like a lot of good people, especially amongst like the laborers in construction, right? But like, from from your perspective, what was like uh one of the biggest lessons you learned while you were working in the construction industry? I think the uh one of the biggest lessons I've learned over the years is to uh you know is when you delegate trust but verify. Um and this goes to uh, you know trusting a customer or trusting an employee, right? So you want to be able to have that process of of delegation and trust to a customer or to an employee, but then have good follow up and making sure that things are happening on the job as they're supposed to, and that like if if there was a certain process in the construction field that let's say the customer was supposed to get the uh, site excavated because some sometimes with the type of construction that we do that is part of what they do there they make sure that somebody comes in and gets the site flat flat excavated so that we can start and so that's just simply a, a smaller area of like okay you trust them to do it but then you also follow up and verify and so as a, as a young age that's something that i that one of the main simple lessons that i learned throughout my life i see so like you know like in uh in the white collar world for instance like it like people are very nice to you like on the surface, but they're, but they're, mm -hmm. they can be very Machiavellian. So in the blue collar world, uh, like I've had a couple of friends in the, uh, in the blue collar world, and they always tell me that people are uh, like, they're like rude and like real to you and authentic. But at the end of the day, they're really, uh, you, once you get past the exterior, like you become like really good friends. So from your, from your perspective, what is the difference between like the blue collar world and the white collar world in in your eyes? You know, I look at it as all human beings come over the same cloth, so to speak. So if you can get to know them as a person, regardless if they're white collar or blue collar, and they learn to trust you as a person, then ultimately the the reactions are the same as a whole. You know, the the elements 
because the white collar and the blue collar, and I get, I think I understand your, your perspective of the difference of how they relate. But a lot of what I see is, is it really comes down to, from my experience, to showing them that you trust them and that you want to help them and be real to them. Okay. Like, yeah, like, I, I just get the vibe that, like, blue-collar people, like, they tend to be really authentic, and, like, especially, like, if you're, like, part of, like, the labor class, like, they're very authentic, mm -hmm. and they're upfront, and, because I, I feel like, you know, like, if you go to the big cities where there's, uh, where, like, you're working at a desk or whatever, there's a lot of office politics, and I'm sure it's then the construction industry as well, but on but in in general, though, a lot of like the people that are working over there are relatively honest and authentic, and that that was just like uh, like I have like a I have like a friend with whom like I discuss these things about like the difference between blue collar America and like white collar America. What are the differences in mindset? And like we have these really interesting conversations on on the personalities and like uh and like how they relate to each other. So, cause like a blue collar people, for instance, like they would just tell, they would just like give you like an insult on your face, like one day and then they'll be like, all right, let's go get a beer right after. But in the white collar world, for instance, they'll be really nice to you. And then uh, behind your back, they'll start scheming and politicking. It's kind of almost like a, it's almost like Washington DC in a lot of ways, mm -hmm. but I don't know, like that's like some of the discussions I had like with my friend. And I don't know how much of it is true and how much of it is a stereotype. But it's something I definitely wanted to ask you about. Yeah. Yeah, it's, you know, I've not put a lot of thought into that, to be quite frank. So, but I do, I do understand your perspective. Like, like, there's some people that will just definitely be nice to you, you know, up front, but turn around and tear you down behind your back. And um, there's definitely a, a factor to that that I've seen as well is that blue collars will generally be more upfront with you, but then they're okay to go out and have a beer with you. Like it's it's who they are. They're genuine in that way. No, totally. But like on a different note, Leon, so mm -hmm. what do you think what was the biggest challenge you had to face in your entrepreneurial journey uh, while you're building your company and how did you overcome it? Hmm. So the biggest challenge that I faced um, at one time was uh, when there was a time. So when I started in construction, I had um, I just had a dream just to be in construction for a short period of time, uh, which is not 17 years, which I'm currently at and planning to be in it for many more years as of now. So at that time, I only plan to be in it for like five to 10 years. I just want to make some good money and then get out of construction. That's how it started. So <clears throat> around that uh, eight year mark, I decided to actually turn it into a real company and grow it. And uh, when I did that, the biggest thing that I found out is I did not know how to hire people. I didn't know how to qualify people properly. And so I went through a three to five year period of hiring people and trying to put them into positions that they weren't qualified for. I didn't know how to lead them properly. So that was a very challenging time of learning how to hire properly, qualify properly, and then to lead them properly. So that was that was the toughest lesson for me. And, and how did you get over it? Like, what is the process in which you learned all of that and overcame that? Because I, I know it can be very awkward, like hiring and like firing people. Like, w w like what is the... Like what was like your modem operand, your like the your policy around that at the end of the day, and yeah. how did it evolve? Well, it um, I've got a couple of people around me finally that really started helping me grow in that area. The um, and primarily coaches, business coaches, um, and good friends that really genuinely wanted to help me grow. Uh, and so the. I think after about three years of doing it wrong, I was like, okay, I see where I went wrong. Like, I need to make sure these people are qualified properly. And not just in skill set, but in, in, you know, are they qualified to be a leader of teams, right? And learning what that means. And so through the hiring process, that was probably the biggest thing is like, uh, you know, understanding what you want to hire for and understanding how to set that up properly. 
and then not rushing into it. You know, the old saying of, of hire slow, fire fast, very true. Like take your time, make sure that you hire right so that you're setting your team up for success and setting them up for success as well. So uh, like from your perspective, like what are the, uh, like what are the characteristics or personality traits you look at in the construction industry where uh, like this person is good to work with in the long term versus is there is there like a like some traits that you find in common where okay this guy is going to be good in the long term whereas this guy no he's not he, he's bad news or something like that the number one trait that um, we look for is humility you know do they have the do they have humility and do they have a growth mindset um, those are two of our core values and that is one of the main reasons they are two of our core values is because, you know, to, to be able to say that, look, man, I don't know everything. You have to be humble to say that. And you have to also understand that life is a journey and it's an infinite game. It is not like, okay, well, now I'm 10 years into this and I know everything, right? Yeah, you know a lot. And, you know, if you have 10 years of experience, you have learned a ton. But if you let that spirit of, of um, like, you know everything overpower you, you're going to let that ego come out of balance. You know, and, and I've heard one person say this once, that if your ego becomes uh, greater than your humility, sorry, your skill set becomes greater than your humility, then your ego will come out. So your humility always has to be greater so that your ego doesn't come out as, as a person. It's, it's really interesting, Leon, that you bring this up because like the key to success in many entrepreneurs that I've noticed, right? Like uh, normally people have a perspective that uh, a lot of like successful business people are egotistical. But from what I've realized is that they had these two traits of like being humble and then trying to learn everything and also having a growth mindset where they would read a lot of books and then they would learn from other people. And they were always in the state of constant growth, but they were also humble enough to do that, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, But then a lot of people have this uh, belief, like, but at the same time, like a lot of people have this belief that successful people have these big egos because they look at all these, like, uh, they look at Wall Street and a bunch of like big corporations, like the Steve Jobs or whatever, and they they assume that that's that's the case. But from what you're saying, in your case at least, like it is the key to success is humility. So I find that really interesting. Yeah, it's definitely one of them. It's uh, you know being able to work with all kinds of different people, being humble allows you to do that. So so the the point that you made though was at some point when your skill set you know, reaches a certain level, right? And then basically you feel confident about your abilities. For a lot of people, their ego will naturally come out because they have a need to feel superior or like their self-worth needs to be validated and all of that mm -hmm. stuff because it's about self-esteem. So from your perspective, how do you have like self-confidence but also stay humble as you're growing mm -hmm. your skill set and your abilities? Because being humble is one of the hardest things in the world for most people. Like especially their if their their skill sets do reach. So from your perspective, how would somebody do that? Yeah, that, that can be a challenge to balance. Um, so when we look at humility, um, true humility is not meekness. It's not it's not um, thinking less of yourself, but it's thinking less about yourself. So it's, it's, you know, you want to be, you know, you want to be able to promote other people. And uh, <clears throat> when you think less of yourself, sorry, you don't want to think less of yourself. You just want to think less about yourself. Because if you, if I continually think about myself, it just promotes an ego. But it's not like I'm lessening my self-worth. Like, I'm confident. I know what I'm talking about as far as the things that I'm trained and skilled in. I'm very confident in that. I understand the products that we that we provide to our customers. I'm confident and it helps them, right? But having the humility of realizing that I'm a human being just like 
anybody else out there in the world. I'm just as fallible, right? I'm not any better than anybody else, but I'm confident in my skill set. I see. It's really interesting because I know like uh, like many years back, I I had the same question myself, like how am I going to be? Because I looked around at a bunch of like, I was like looking around, like especially uh, like whenever I looked at the successful financial people at New York, for instance, like mm -hmm. all of these successful people had these giant egos. And I was like, okay, I want to be successful, but I don't want to be egotistical. But how do you become successful without uh, presenting like a certain aura of like success and all that stuff you know because a lot of people like uh like in whether it's in california but especially in the new york area like they have this giant egos that come with their massive success like especially in the construction industry so it, it's something that i was it was like a hard thing for me to do like like not having low self-esteem and like but being humble but also having a high level of self-confidence because a lot of people believe it or not leon equate self-confidence with big egos mm -hmm. yeah and I, you know that's one that i don't know yet how to overcome like how do you without having that one-on-one -on -one relationship to where people can really feel you speaking from the heart like like how are they going to know that your self-confidence is not ego because they don't know how to separate that um i don't know i don't have an answer on that uh, uh, I'm still digging in and trying to learn on what that means and how to come across in a way that is confident, but yet not egotistic. Well, Leon, I mean, I don't think you realize this, but like you're like the way, like you're a pretty humble person, but you're also being successful in your business. And it, it's actually inspiring a lot of people because a lot of people will see that and they'll be like, okay, mm -hmm. I don't have to be an egotistical guy like some of these like uh, like New York people or like in not just New York, like all over the place, like yeah. in order to be successful in business, I can be humble. I can have a healthy self-esteem and uh, still grow and like basically learn a lot, you know, because it's mm -hmm. uh, like that's that way you can actually achieve more success. But I totally agree in regards to that. Mm -hmm. Um, so if, uh, so Leon, if you have, uh, like somebody in the, like, let's say somebody is entering the construction industry, just the same way you did, but they don't want to do just a job anymore. They want to start their own business. How would a construction person like in, uh, like who's like doing like a day-to-day -day job transition from what he's doing there to starting his own business? Like what kind of advice would you give to this person? I think the first thing is, is decide what kind of construction you want to do because to be successful in construction the more narrow um, your field of construction is the more successful you're going to be uh, you know a jack of all trades as they say as the saying goes is not going to be become really good or very highly skilled at one thing right so i think deciding like okay hey i want to build homes for example so if you want to do residential homes then decide that you're good that's the niche that you're going to go into and once you've decided that then you know you need to just evaluate like all the things that it's going to take you to get started and save enough of money to where you can go ahead and, and uh, put the systems and processes in place to uh, go ahead and get started Okay, but like, so, but like a more accurate, but like more, like, let's say if we had to go deeper. So a lot of construction workers, like they, uh, they're basically living paycheck to paycheck, right? And they want to get out of the state of uh, like just living by month to month. Uh, how would they save or like, what, what would be the process like where they take this massive risk or they're like, okay, I'm going to start my own business and I'm going to make this happen. And like, what is like the mindset that they require and also like the tools they would need to make that transition? So I think there's two things here when you look at that question. And that is, is not everybody is made for entrepreneurship. Maybe they're looking for entrepreneurship. Maybe they're wanting to be a part of a successful team, right? And so when you look at that, because entrepreneurship is risk-taking. And some people are not comfortable with taking the amount of risk that it takes to go ahead and, and start a company. Um, and so the other part of the question is, is how do they save? How do they get started? Right. So the, you know, the baseline is, is 
is working on creating a better skill set as fast as you can so that you can up your the pay scale that you're getting paid so that you can also save more uh, and at the same time live at a reasonable level so that the more you can save so that you can go ahead and start investing it into a startup company. Interesting. Yeah, I mean, basically, they have to save and like they have to develop a specialized skill set that is mm-hmm. that is like highly valuable. So yeah. yeah, one one other thing I just thought of though that's also really important is working on your personal leadership skills because that is that is something that you will need to use a lot. So if you're really thinking about getting started in a business, is work on your leadership skills where you're at. Start reading some books. Start reading, uh, listening to some pod, more podcasts and understanding what is it going to take to be able to lead teams and people and help grow people. No, totally. Like, yeah, I agree with that. Like basically education and self-improvement is the key. In fact, that's like part of like what Extraordinary America is about. It's about people having financial education, the improving, basically becoming passionate about their work, whatever they're doing and figuring out a way to monetize it, right? Because- Ultimately, right. you want to do something that you uh, that you don't feel like you're working. It's just something you naturally, mm-hmm. it's not work. It's just you're having fun or you're like passionate about it, right? So yeah, but Leon, on a, on a completely different note, right? So, you know, they say America is the land of the free and the place where dreams are made. Do you agree or disagree with that statement? It definitely is. If you're willing to go out and put the work in and take the risk. You know, I think it's it's become a little bit more in my own perspective where too many people feel like it's always has to be handed to them, maybe might be one way of saying it. But if you are willing to put in the work and go out there and take risk, it's definitely a ton of opportunity. No, yeah. Um like, you know, like a lot of like so I was like looking up at a lot of these documentaries, especially about how america was made and like basically there was this one episode about like the forging of steel like how steel uh, how construction and like steel and like building created what america is today you know because it was like a wild wild west but it was essentially the construction industry that made america into the skyscrapers and just like like all these cities were built based on that And essentially what you realize, Leon, is that it's essentially construction people and blue collar America that essentially build America into what it is today, like the skyscrapers, the beautiful buildings and all that. So from your perspective, what is the because I don't I don't feel like a lot of people appreciate and recognize the contributions that people in the construction industry have played towards the rise of America throughout the 19th and 20th century. But from your perspective, what what we would say is the their contribution wow that's a question i've never been asked before uh it definitely has a huge contribution in 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 the growth and the rise of america uh but i think it's if you really look deeper into that it's people that had passion for opportunity for their families you know it it was freedom it was for making a better life for their children and for their grandchildren and so you know when you break passion down when they're passionate they're willing to suffer for a time for something better um and that and i think that's really what drove most americans no matter what industry you're looking into is because they're looking for something better and making and providing a better lifestyle, uh, you know, and providing generational wealth to their grandchildren, great grandchildren, and giving them the opportunity to also be a part of a great country and a great uh, opportunity that this country provides. Like, Leon, you know, uh, one of the reasons I was so excited about interviewing you was because you were basically one of the symbols of like what 19th century and 20th century, like, the construction worker that came over there, like they have faith in their family, like they were Christians. And then they basically built, uh, they were entrepreneurial minded and they were also into like construction. And then all these skyscrapers built were built as a result. 
And like, you're kind of like a symbol in that regard. Like you're a good person, you're humble, you're hardworking. And then you basically, uh, you like, you have like a strong faith in God. And then you, you also have a family and then you're like, you're taking part in this process of building all these buildings. But it was like, it was the, all of these blue collar hands that combined together to build America to where it is today. So I want to let you know that you're actually pretty inspiring to a lot of people, especially with, with the, the generosity in your heart and all of that. Well, thank you. Appreciate that. Yeah. So, uh, so Leon, uh, there's one thing I wanted to ask you regarding the American dream. So, you know, like a lot of Americans are right now trying to realize the American dream in their own way, right? Mm -hmm. From your perspective, what is, uh, what is the American dream about and how would Americans achieve it? Mm. So, I think when you look at the American dream, um, another way that you could say that would be what does success look like to you? So, you know, one person's American dream might be a little bit different than mine per se, uh, or as another person, it varies. But I think ultimately, when you boil that down, the American dream, uh, the American dream was, you know, the land of opportunity, of being able to make something better for other people. So it, it it's it's a it's a way of serving other people and making the you know the home life and for their children and for their great grandchildren better every day. And when you tie that all back to what does success look like, you know, you have to ask yourself the question, well, what is what is my American dream? And although my goals can change, you know, ultimately my American dream and what that means to me is that I'm faithful to God, that I'm faithful to my family, and that I'm faithful to the people around me in the companies and the teams that I'm working with. And ultimately, that will lead to success. That's the legacy I want to leave. That is that is amazing, Leon. Like, yeah, uh, that is kind of like, uh, that's kind of like if you ask any person, like from, let's say, uh, the blue collar world or like if like like there's like you know like small town versus like the big city type of dream and they have like these two divergent kind of things but you're basically what you're talking about right now is basically people in like the small like the rural america or like blue collar america like they believe in that altogether right but like from your perspective what is the biggest challenge that americans face when it comes to realizing the american dream from your perspective and how would they overcome it I think when you look, uh, the biggest challenge for overcoming uh, to be able to realize the American dream, uh, there's this thing on happiness. So what, what creates someone to have a inspired life and an American dream, you know, of being free uh, and living the life that they desire. And part of that, I think, is is learning to let go of the things they can't control and learning to see what they can control. And then and then reaching out and taking some risk, being able to, you know, saying, look, you know, these are some of the goals and the things that I want to achieve in my life and reaching out to people to surround themselves with people that are successful, that are living the dream life that they want to live. And and that way it inspires them to make those moves and do what it takes. Well, wow, Leon, it's, it's really interesting that you're, that you say that, right? Cause I mean, let's say like in your instance, like you believe in faith, family, humility, and like, like you're not like, if you take a look at the like big city, like big cities, like let's say like Miami or Houston, Dallas or New York or mm -hmm. Los Angeles and everything, like their version of the American dream is hedonistic materialism, right? But you're symbolizing the more like, you know, like in the 19th century, 20th century, where like they had faith and they, their, their, their Christian faith and their family and then having humble and serving others like that, like they had more happiness doing that. And it's almost like these two divergent worlds 
And it's, that's the thing that fascinates me. Like while I'm interviewing you right now, that's what I'm thinking about because like, you know, you have the big yeah. city, uh, dream. Like if you ask the big city people, what's the American dream? But like, I want these fast cars. I want these, I want like, I want these jet airplane. I want the yacht. I want, I want like all the, I want all the hot girls, like all of the whole nine. And then when you go to like, let's say your version of the American dream, it's like, these are the two dreams that I keep coming. I keep coming across. It's like almost like two forks yeah. in a row. And then it's like fate, it's family. It's, uh, it's about the little things. It's about gratitude, humility, friendships and all that. And that's, that's what I find like really interesting, but I don't know. Do you have like any opinion on this matter? Yes, I do. It, um, when you look at the, you know, gaining assets, uh, materialism, there's nothing wrong with owning a jet, owning multiple houses, owning billions of dollars worth of real estate. It's great. Uh, but there's there's one thing to realize. None of that makes the American dream true necessarily because you can own all that and be not happy it, in itself it doesn't bring happiness in itself it does not uh make you successful yes it may make you successful in a monetary standpoint but that's where it comes back to you to define what does success mean to you what does the american dream mean to you and if the american dream means to you to build billions of dollars worth of it in real estate to your own you know tons of different corporations and so forth then go for it like I'm, no, I'm not saying that you shouldn't but I think you need to evaluate uh, what really makes the difference and what is the legacy that you want to leave when you die Leon this is this is like go, hitting the nail in the coffin because like basically a lot of people's ideas on their American dream are the ninth they to see 1980s New York and they're like greed is good you know, like the garden gecko, the greed is good. And their their idea of the American dream was like the New York, like high life lifestyle. But basically, it's all coming down ultimately to the pursuit of happiness. Like what is the way right. to pursue happiness, right? And there's so right now two divergent uh, ways that Americans are going about trying to pursue it. One is the hedonistic, materialistic way. And the other is the spiritual way, right? Or like the, or like more of the, hum the humility way of like, the way of faith and it's almost like kind of like a spiritual war in like my mind at least but i don't know like that could just that that's just like a perspective that i have but a lot of people feel that way yeah like there's they say okay yeah. small town the small town version of american dream versus the big city version of american dream one is all about like okay if you have this 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 if i have this car I have like this lifestyle, I'll be happy. And then the others are like, no, it's going to be about faith. It's going to be about helping others. It's going to be about humility, right? And it's going to be about like things that truly make us extraordinary. And yeah, that's basically, yeah. Yeah, yeah that's, that's uh, you know, and just one thing to clarify here. Like it's like, it's not like I see anything wrong with having the nice car, the nice home, the beautiful mansion on the beach or whatever. Like I want some of those things and, and uh, you know, I will continue growing my real estate base. But the, the, the fact is I also know those things don't ultimately make me happy when I go home in the evening. You know, it's, it's realizing like, you know, when you help people and, and realizing like what truly uh, brings you satisfaction, right? And that may vary a little bit for some people. Some people, it, it's different uh, due to their skill sets and, and their nature and their personality. But I know for myself, like, the more helpful I am, the less helpless that I feel. That is awesome, Leon. So, Leon, from your perspective, how important is financial freedom when it comes to the pursuit of happiness and also the opportunity for a better life? How important is the is freedom in the pursuit of happiness? Yeah, like like can we be happy without uh, like while being enslaved or like uh, or can we be happy 
like is happiness dependent on being free in a, from from your perspective because a lot of people like they're uh they're kind of like stuck in their lives or they're living paycheck to paycheck but yeah like but these are the these are the principles of our american identity so mm -hmm. how like from your perspective how important is freedom when it comes to realizing our american mm -hmm. identity altogether well freedom is definitely something i value um uh, you know, when you look at financial independence versus happiness, if you're not happy when you're broke, more than likely you won't be happy when you have financial freedom. Because happiness is a state of mind. It's not how much you have. Now, don't get me wrong. Definitely easier to be happy when you're able to pay your bills, when you have financial freedom. It's definitely easier. And I would much rather have that than being broke 100%. Uh, so, but at, at the essence and the core of being happy, I don't believe is made up of how financially free you are or not. Okay, so what you're saying is that uh, after a certain point where you can pay your bills and you're comfortable financially, more money is not going to make you happy. Now it comes exactly. down to a state of mind. No, I totally, I totally get with that. You know, like our state of mind and how we see the world and our mindset plays a big role in that. But yeah, it, it's, it's a, it's always an interesting conversation regarding it. Cause you know, like a lot of people, especially uh, they try to get happiness in external things, but yeah, it's ultimately a state of mind. So, yeah. but, but like, like Leon on a different note, um, I know like you're the CEO and founder of, of Keystone Construction, and also you founded a company, uh, uh, Blu-ray Garage Door, right? Can you tell me and the audience a little bit more about these company, uh, these companies, and what do they do, and how did you get about creating them? Sure. So Keystone Construction, uh, that is a post-frame construction company, and what we do there is there's a couple of different uh, buildings that we build there. One is we do residential barn dominiums um, and uh, then also do garages and workshops. We do warehouses and we also do ag buildings as well, agricultural buildings. And so that that's the primary uh, thing that we do in Keystone Construction. And, uh, and then in the Blue Jay Garage Doors Company, we founded that two years ago, April of 2021. And that one there would be commercial and residential garage doors. Okay, uh, nice. And like the second company that you created, like what is what is like your motivation for creating the second company? Like you already yeah. were doing Keystone Construction, right? So what made you do the second one? We had a big need for garage door service and installation in our first company. So we, several years ago, we got started in uh, hanging our own garage doors and servicing them in Keystone Construction. So what we ended up doing, we ended up breaking that company off of the Keystone Construction and put making it its own standalone company and growing that as a separate company now. Awesome. Yeah. So, Leon, uh, is there like a project that you're doing right now like where, uh, that you'd want the audience to get a glimpse of? Yeah, we're uh, we're building a sizable barn dominium that we could definitely show them a couple of pictures of. Okay, that is awesome. So yeah, um, yeah how how can our how can our audience connect with you and uh, to get to know more about you and what what you what you're doing? Hmm. Yeah, so I primarily am on Instagram and Facebook. Uh, so if you go Instagram dot com forward slash Leon Linebaugh. Uh, same thing with Facebook at Leon Linebaugh and also uh, YouTube. Uh, and then also you can go to our website, Keystone Construction uh, or KeystonePostFrames.com. And then also our website with uh, BlueJayGarageDoors.com. Okay, awesome, Leon. So, well, Leon, I want to let you know that I, I was really, I'm really honored to like have you on this show. And uh, it was amazing for you to like uh, share your insights about success and also about Amer the American dream and all of that. And I would definitely want you to come back at a later time on the show.
Hey, that would be fun. The honor's all mine. Like I want to let you, I want to let you know that you're basically like you're like a like kind of like a light in the darkness that right now we have in America, especially in regards to like having that entrepreneurial spirit. Like you have this core American identity, and a lot of people, uh, like they will be inspired just like by you doing what you're doing, you know. And so, awesome. I I want to I want to conclude this show by letting all my fellow extraordinary Americans know that hey. There's an extraordinary within each and every one of us, and it's our duty to awaken it and unleash it. So until next time, bye for now. Hey there, everyone. Thank you.